Welcome. Today's program flight review was originally created by Walt Schummel. Steve Brady will be our presenter today. Steve himself has been a CFI and involved in, in aviation for more than 30 years. He's been CFI of the year, aviation safety counselor of the year, and he's been a DPE. Today, Steve Brady works with the Orlando FISDO and he's a principal operations inspector. Welcome this remarkable person who has a dedication to CFI training and who will give you some remarkable information on how to work a good flight review. Steve Brady. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see everybody out here. Um, as she mentioned, I'm going to be filling in for Walt Shama. Walt is one of our aviation pioneer gurus and he uh, unfortunately is took an, taken ill and he's off getting some treatment um, and I'm very honored to be in filling in for his shoes. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Safety Center. What a wonderful place to come and learn about aviation and uh, I literally raised my kids here and coming this Sunday my grandson will be to come he will come here Sunday and get to uh, enjoy what we've built over the years. The flight review Two of the biggest responsibilities that flight instructors have is the recommendations that they make for applicants going to take a practical test and their conduct and how they present, prepare, and get somebody ready for a flight review. If you look in this little slide that Walt put up there, you'll see the instructor sitting there with a, a coat and tie on. That's pretty rare in Florida anymore as for the summer years, it's in the summer months, it's so hot and the instructors are getting younger and younger and younger. I think that might be because I'm getting older and older and older. I instructed and still instruct. One of the, one of the things I don't like about working for the FAA is that they don't allow us to instruct. We can instruct, however, out of our district, but our district is so big I'd have to about drive to Georgia to do so. Um, the, the new instructors, they, as they begin to get seasoned, they get hired by the airline so quickly that there's not a maturity level that we, that we like to see. And, and when you go to the, to the smaller fixed base operators, you will see that the um, instructors, you might find one or two uh, retired airline captains and or seasoned CFIs that are still working. And those are kind of people that the occasional flyer will gravitate to. One of the things with a flight review is that it's not a pass-fail test. It is, however, a, uh, a performance standard that the, the pilot must meet. And one of the problems we face in our, in our industry is there are a lot of people out there who will if you'll notice in the bottom left-hand portion of that slide, it says the $100 hamburger. And they'll go get their favorite flight instructor and hop in the airplane and go fly 30, 40, 50 miles and eat a hamburger and come back, and there's a magic endorsement in the back of the logbook. The true crux of a flight review is to review procedures and, and practices and rules that have changed and, and to review the skill level of the applicant. Now, when I was teaching every day, I was very proficient and I felt like I could handle most situations that the applicant and or the aircraft could um, provide and challenges that the weather might provide. But now working for the FAA, uh, we don't get to fly as off often and the, I notice my skill levels are, are reducing. So now I get to look at it from more of an aspect of a pilot who may or may not own an airplane in the, in the high cost of an airplane. They may once every couple months or once every five months or once every six months, they may go rent an aircraft and fly that aircraft. Are they proficient? Probably, probably not. The flight review is a method by which the FAA allows us to, the instructor, 
to be looked at every 24 months. Now the flight review is not to be confused with the dreaded FAA practical test. And what happens on practical test is that these applicants will come in unprepared, so they might as well come into the test blindfolded. And it's very frustrating from an examiner slash inspector standpoint because you know they're going to fail. The flight review is mandated by our Code of Federal Regulations 6156 and what that says is that every 24 calendar months a person must take a flight review with an authorized flight instructor and it must consist of a minimum of one hour ground on the Code of Federal Regulations under 61 and Part 91. Now what I do when I taught years ago, I used to teach 61 was all the eligibility, all the requirements, how to get it, what items you needed, your medical, et cetera, et cetera, on how to get it. Parts 91 was the rules, how to keep it. So that's the way we kind of broke it out. And so the flight review would consist of airspace reviews, recency of experience, eligibility, aircraft performance and limitations, and of course the 91 rules, such as the air speeds, the speed, the aircraft speeds, the minimum safe altitudes, the, the operating requirements in class Delta, class Bravo, class Charlie airspaces, and so forth and so on. Having said that, one hour is the mandated requirement in 6156. And as an inspector, I find, especially when, with regard to deviations, pilot deviations where a pilot has deviated from a known rule, that one hour typically is not enough to get back up to speed since the two-year previous uh, review. And of course it says that the flight maneuvers will be conducted to the, to the standards of the certificate held. And I have a little issue with that. If you read it carefully in 6156, if a, if a gentleman comes to you for a flight review and you're a flight instructor and he or she holds an, air, an airline transport pilot certificate, but you review their log book and you, and you realize that this person might fly an average of 10, 15 hours a year and they typically go you know, on the Sunday afternoon hamburger run, it would be ludicrous to try to give that person a flight review to the ATP standard for which they hold that certificate. So if you read the rule very carefully in 6156, it says, at the discretion of the per person conducting the review. So I, I caution flight instructors when you, just because they hold an ATP and or a flight instructor certificate, you need to have some discretion. A lot of flight instructors out there today do online flight instructor validation courses. Some do refresher clinics. Uh, you know, the FERC is a clinic. And so use, be judicious in how you determine how you're going to give that review. Is one hour enough for you is a question you have to ask. And when I was a flight instructor, and I still am, however, I'm not allowed to teach, as a flight instructor, I always realized that the, the candidate or the applicant, if you will, was the owner of the company. They were paying me to conduct a flight review. However, I conducted it like I was the CEO. And so one of the questions I would ask them is, are you familiar with the practical test standards? Now these are just a picture of what they look like. These are commercially bound versions that you can buy. We at the FAA have our in-house practical tests. They're, they're they're actuals, these are reprints out of the FAA, like 8081, uh, private, you have your commercial, you have your instrument. Now these are all for flight instructor. And it lists tasks and tables that you're required to test to. Now the flight review is required every 24 calendar months before you can act as PIC. And a lot of times when we investigate a deviation, where somebody has deviated from a rule, we'll find that they haven't had a flight review, they haven't obtained a certificate and or rating, and they haven't attended a WINGS program within the previous 24 months. So that person is not legal to fly under the 6156 rule. A little while earlier I asked the question, is one hour enough for you? Certainly if you get the one hour and if you, of ground and if you get the one hour of flight training, and the instructor so recommends you, 
excuse me, you're current, but are you proficient? Are you proficient to go out here and fly in the winds like they've been the last few days? Are you proficient to totally go fly in the airspace like we have today? Unfortunately, aircraft accidents are, are going to happen. One of our functions as safety inspectors and, and you people as, as advocates of aviation safety, we're trying to reduce the accidents. It would be wonderful to be put out of a job. It would be wonderful to be, not have a job because then there, there's nobody's crashing. But unfortunately, the only way to do that is to ground all the aircraft. And no activity would mean there's no accidents. And, and then somehow or another, we'd still have an accident. Somebody'd run into one with a car. However, we have found that we can significantly reduce accidents by proper training, by, by this forum, by forums such as this all over the country, by our FAST team, our, safety, our aviation safety team now that's going worldwide. And I just learned this morning that we're enlisting the, uh, the um, South America, Central America, they're going to reach out and model their program right out of this. It's an amazing thing. I was, I was grinning ear to ear with pride. When you dig down on an accident, and I am an accident investigator, it's one, of the, it's one of the unfortunate parts of our duty is to have to go do an accident. An accident chain occurs, there's all kinds of things that lead up to it, and if any one of those chains could have been broken, the accident would not have occurred. And in my opinion, flight instructors need to do a better job when they get this biannual look. The word biannual no longer appears in the regulation. So what else must we include in this program? What else should be included when we look at the 6191? I want to give you an example of a, of a deviation that I investigated. We, um, I had a, a gentleman who hadn't flown in probably 11 years. And as he got on up into the years, he became very uh, mature with his finances. His children had moved away, and he had a lot of money, so he bought an airplane. And he bought it up in, in the Northeast, and he was going to fly it back to Florida. And his son and him went up together. And so, rightfully so, he went to a fixed base operator that had a little, you know, freelance flight instructor working there. And he got the required one hour of flight, one hour ground. The instructor signed him off, and he went and purchased his airplane, and lo and behold, they were flying back. And they, they really liked those submarines by St. Simons, Georgia. So they circled around those a couple times. And of course, that's a temporary, that's a, that is a restricted area for our nuclear submarine base up in Georgia. But it sure looked good, and they had jets scrambled on them, and then, and then unfortunately, the paperwork came across my desk, and, and there we were. So my investigation, he had a one-hour flight review. Remember one-hour ground, one-hour flight? But he hadn't flown in eight or nine years. In the airspace had changed. Temporary flight restrictions had popped up due to the 9-11. And the guy clearly wasn't up to speed in the areas that, that he should have been. Is this his fault? He got the one-hour ground. He got the endorsement in his law book. It all looked peachy keeny. So I folded out a chart and I showed him some areas and I asked him a few questions. And it was painful obvious. We did a timeout. Timeout. The problem was with this man's flight instructor. And the flight instructor had given him a rushed, abbreviated flight review, assuming that this gentleman was up to speed. And as an instructor, one of the things that I've always done is I, I really use my oral quizzing to determine if the applicant is up to speed. And, and when you oral quiz somebody, you're really finding out if you've been effective as a teacher. And don't let anybody kid you that a flight review is not a instructional process, because it is. You get to log dual in your logbook as well as pilot command. One of the things you should talk about with your applicant is have there been any changes to the practical test standards? If you keep up with practical test standards, you will find that over periods of time, they put the cross control stall in, they took the cross control stall out. They put the accelerated stall in, the accelerated stall came out. Years ago, we used to teach spins. Spins are no longer. CFIs have to have done them with another flight instructor preparing them for the test, but they don't have to demonstrate it 
unless they have failed them in the oral or, or demonstrated to the examiner and or inspector that they're not proficient in stall spin awareness and spin recoveries. Performance and limitations. I always review the logbook. If I see they've been flying a Bonanza A36 for years and years and they come to take a, a flight review in a 172, well, I might ask some Bonanza questions. Certainly within my purview to do that. And because we're reviewing their knowledge of that particular aircraft. See, the license doesn't discriminate. We don't give type ratings certificate for 172 only. However, some of these new uh, electronically advanced glass cockpit airplanes, they call them TAA aircraft, there's going to be some changes down the road because there's some significant differences in those airplanes and it might require a, a specific endorsement been tested and checked and, and found qualified to act as pilot command of a blank blank you know fast flight with a glass cockpit. Weight and balance we still continue to have weight and balance issues. People think that if you can fit it in there and close the door, the plane will fly. And that's not necessarily the case. Using the aeronautical information manual, very, very important. Uh, my wife will confirm that I have a copy sitting on the back of the toilet. That's for the spare time. And I always ask the applicant, during this flight review, is there any areas that you are concerned about? Is there areas that you feel that you're weak? Do you, do you feel, is there any areas that you want to uh, have extra emphasis placed upon? When I was teaching uh, years ago before I came on board with the, with the flight standards office, is I advertised online and um, a lot of people would come to Florida to take their wife and kids to Disney World and after the first or second day the guys were done with it they wanted to go fly so they would come down here and have a flying vacation and we would typically spend two days it cost them about five hundred dollars and they would get two days of intense flight review training and I always at the end I mean at the end of it they'd always give me even a tip or passes to the dinner theater or something just for for really getting involved with a good flight review Again, one of the problems we have is these young instructors are using this job simply as a stepping stone to get to the airlines. I belong to a team at our flight standards office, which is called a CFI Special Emphasis Program, and we track on a monthly basis all the accidents and or incidents in our district. And the number one is loss of direction control on takeoff or landing. Years ago, if you've been coming to this forum, we did some filming. Uh, one of the doctors did some filming up at New Smyrna Airport, and they did 438 landings. And it was a plethora of landings, crisscross, crossways, side loads, landing in the grass, landing half on the runway, half off the grass, no elevator back pressure, five or six bounces on the porpoise, not one go around. So it's not unusual to understand why they're crashing um, after they've touched down and or the rollout. I remember Rod, Rod Machado had us dying in tears laughing when he stated he was in an aircraft that was, the guy was out of control and they were fixing to crash and the tower said, are you okay? And Rod told him, he said, stand by, we're still crashing. Airplanes are done flying when you park it back at the ramp and chalk it. This is, like we said, this is Walt's program, and Walt turned that slide green because it makes us sick to have to go investigate an accident or incident that has occurs on a landing. Problem areas defined on practical test. Our FISDO has a website, and you can look on it, and we have problem areas that we find with flight instructors when they take their practical test. Now, People say, well, how does that relate to the flight review? Well, that's the person that's giving you the flight review, is the new flight instructor. So you can go to our Orlando Flight Standards website, just www.fa.gov, and navigate your way through the, the uh, website, and you will get to an area, and it'll say CFI Special <laughs> Emphasis Areas. And these are weak areas that, the flight that they exhibit on practical tests. soft field operations. As an inspector and as a former pilot examiner, I always took my private applicants to a grass field. 
And 99 out of 100 of them would tell you, I've never been to grass field in my life. So they are simulating a soft field takeoff and a soft field landing on hard surface runways. And if anybody has read the Fundamentals of Instructing Handbook, it talks about the principle of intensity. And it says you learn more from a real thing than from a substitute. And I, quite frankly, I don't see how you can substitute soft field on a hard surface runway. I don't see how you can substitute short field on a 10,000 foot runway because it doesn't give you the same appearance as those trees rushing up to the aircraft. Steep turns, we find that to be a big area. People don't understand the forces acting on the aircraft, especially in the turn where the aircraft gets more of a load on the wing and you feel it in the seat of your pants and you have to make applicable corrections with the controls to make the aircraft maintain altitude within the required standards for the private. It's a plus or minus 100 feet, 10 knots, and 10 degrees of initial entry heading. Unusual attitudes. They must be looked at during a flight review. And yet people to, to this day can't demonstrate a, a proper unusual attitude. Cross-country planning. What do you all think is the biggest reason cross-country has gone by the wayside? GP, absolutely. Let the record show that people nailed it. GPS, going perfectly straight box. You plug it in, they have them in their car now. Turn right, safety center, 20 feet on right. It's here. And people, you know, they talk about GPS of the future. GPS is the present. It's been out for a long time. And people rely on it as a crutch. But let me give you a true story. I was delivering an aircraft, one of our uh, volunteers, and we were going to the Middle East with it. And uh, I was a captain flying, and he was my navigator. And we were just to the west side of, ba of Iraq and just east of Israel. And we were headed towards Damascus, the Syria VOR, when all the radios and aircraft fail. Now, nobody wants to stray into Iraqi airspace, right? And so we took out an old E6B and whiz wheeled what our last known wind corrections were and put in appropriate time to the where the proposed vortex would be and the wind correction angle. And it was quite refreshing to, when we got our equipment back, to be on course, you know, within a, within a mile. The practical test gives you um, five minutes and three miles is what we test to when we're giving somebody a good old fashioned pilotage and dead reckoning, which people don't do enough anymore. But that should be the first thing. A, a, a planned cross country at the maximum range of the aircraft is what it says with maximum allowable baggage to the first intended fuel stop is what the practical test standards say. Now, on the other hand, we investigated a crash several years ago. Girl force landed a 150 in a cow pasture out of fuel after flying it for four hours and ten minutes about 15 miles south of Ocala Vortex. And when questioned, airplane, there was no damage. She was shaken up a little bit. She was more afraid of what the school was going to do to her for, for landing an airplane in a cow pasture. But when we asked her, why didn't you use the VOR? And her answer was, my instructor told me not to use it until after I completed my cross countries. So here we have the from one end to the other. GPS is a great tool. It's a great, and it's, but it's great to have the backup, if you will, so that Number five doesn't become a problem. If you have planned properly, situational awareness shouldn't be a problem. If the person taking the flight review is going for an a instrument proficiency check included, uh, it, situational awareness becomes paramount with respect to where they are in the, in the aerodrome area. Where are they with, respe with respect to the initial approach fix, final approach fix? And you will find uh, the last few, uh, we, in our CFI Special Emphasis Program, I noticed three failures of applicants at a school that teaches primary instrument uh, instruction. They failed situational awareness, which tells us that that particular facility has a problem teaching people to become codependent on, on GPSs. Okay? Don't get me wrong. I love a GPS, and I will use one every chance I get and I advocate the use of it. But we also advocate having a sectional and a plotter and a some sort of flight computer. The flight review also should include 
stall recoveries. Now remember, this was Mr. Schaumel's program. In my opinion, we need to teach more about stall recognitions. And once we know how to recognize them, then we can go out and do the uh, recovery. There are still people today, believe it or not, that are afraid of stalling an aircraft. And it's just, it, it blows my mind because a stall simply means that the aircraft is doing what it's supposed to do. The wing is unloading itself so it doesn't damage itself. And a lot of stall recoveries can be addressed early on in the phases of training. What I did with my students is when we talked about the stall and you see the eyelids poke up looking for, for body movement, looking for body language, I would let them know that we're going to stall the airplane every time we fly it. And we're, hopefully we're going to stall it about six inches above the runway and make a great landing. Everybody wants to learn how to land an airplane. All the other stuff becomes academic. You got to land so you can solo. So solo is the big driving force. And then years later, we still have people on a flight review that are, have 30, 40 years under their belt of flying, and they still won't demonstrate an appropriate stall. We talked about steep turns earlier. I won't, I won't beat that up too much. Steep turns allow you to develop proficiency in what we call mastering the aircraft. Commercial grade are 50 degrees of bank, you know, 45 to 50, 55 max. And the, to the FAA, a normal turn is 30 to 45 degrees. And of course, IFR, you wouldn't want to conduct steep turns and you'd want to keep the turn coordinator on a standard rate turn. Unusual attitude recoveries, still see people doing them incorrectly, overloading the aircraft, not having a good idea of how to unload the aircraft before they recover properly, and slow flight. Slow flight is a great maneuver, and typically if somebody can get their aircraft configured as in the landing configuration and or clean and fly the airplane as absolutely as slow as it will fly, they, they have a pretty good handle and you have a pretty good idea that that person has mastered their aircraft. And all aircraft have a different slow flight characteristic. Anybody ever had their airplane come back from an annual and it doesn't slow fly like it used to? It might take more input, less input, and that, that can come from a, a myriad of things. Rudder cables now being tightened up, aileron cables being tightened up. A person's skill level over a period of a year might not be the same, and they might not. I know that my skills aren't as good as they used to be as I get older. Eyes aren't as good. I don't, excuse me, I don't hear as well, and I don't get to fly every day like I used to. Takeoffs and landings. I cannot, Im I can't imagine what goes through some people's mind when they're coming into land. An airplane is, I'm looking to the left and the runway is to my right and there's no crosswind. Or there's a crosswind and they're not doing any correction for it. When you see the nose tire of a Cessna 172, and if you walk around some of these little flight schools, you'll see the nose tire scuffed up on 172s. What does that tell you about their method of crosswind correction? To get a sideways scuff on a nose tire, your aircraft was, was exacerbated and it was, a lo it was a skew, a tremendous amount from the longitudinal center line of the runway. And again, our number one accident incident issue is departing control flight on a landing or departing control flight after landing rollout. The stall recoveries. For the private practical test standards, it requires you to recover from the stall after the stall has occurred, i.e. a full stall. On any given day, I can, I can tell you people, as soon as it gets a little mushy on the controls, they want to recover. They've not demonstrated a stall. They've dem demonstrated an, an imminent or the initial phases, but they've not got the full stall. And a lot of it is bred into them for fear. And and that would go back, that's an instructional problem. It, it, it points to no other problem but the instructors. They were probably, their instructor was probably afraid of stalls. It, they passed on that fear to this instructor who was afraid of stalls. And subsequently it's, it's on to this pilot that now is being reviewed. If your aircraft, if you, when you lose pitch control, if you did nothing, most typical aircraft will begin, they will regain flying because the aircraft, if it's trimmed properly, once it pitches over, the tail quits flying, the tail's going to pitch up, the nose is going to pitch down, and now we've got a, 
the wings are going to start making lift again and the aircraft's going to summarily start to fly again. And it's just that simple. Now there's some other inputs required to maybe raise a wing and stuff like that. But the, the bottom line is in a stall the wings no longer can support the weight of the aircraft. And the aircraft gets flying and if it's trimmed properly, most U.S. certificated aircraft, they will go back to flying automatically. The commercial practical test standards requires as the stall occurs, and, and again Mr. Schommel has put in a slide here, at the first buffet with no loss of pitch control. In both cases, the aircraft is telling you that it's no longer wanting to fly. You, your speed is such that, and, and another problem that I find, they don't understand speed. They don't understand that the aircraft can stall at a myriad of speeds. Put the aircraft in a 30 degree bank, 20 degree bank, and pull the control wheel back. And you can accelerate the stall by increasing the load. At the CFI level, if I'm renewing a flight instructor, I certainly look at and have them review a velocity diagram, a VG diagram, so that they can tell me what the accelerated stall line looks like. They can tell me when the airplane's going to unload itself. And, it, and they can graph it based on that airplane. Power on stalls, typically in, in Mr. Schommel's example here, you want to slow to lift off speed roughly 60 knots and 55, 60 knots in a 172. And you pitch the aircraft up to, a, to the stall attitude and you apply full power. Our practical test standards requires at the discretion of the examiner between zero and 20 degrees of bank and to the right and to the left and straight ahead. I do all three on a flight review and I also uh, add one other stall and I, and I will demonstrate it first so that they know that I'm not trying to kill them. I will have them put their feet flat on the floor and apply a, a nose up pitch attitude and apply full throttle. And as the aircraft starts to climb the P factor and the torque make the aircraft start yawing to the left. Very, not so much torque so much because the wings are counteracting that but the P factor is making the aircraft's nose yaw to the left and of course as it does that the left wing wants to drop and normally we would push right rudder to keep the ball centered but in this case we don't do that we keep raising the nose and we apply right aileron as the nose as the left wing drops so we try to maintain wings level with right aileron counteracting the adverse yaw and the and yaw, yaw caused by P factor and what's going to happen as the airplane just enters its full stall, it's going to break over to the left in a cross-control stall. Most people have never seen a cross-control stall, and the recovery technique is very simple. You simply lower the nose, right rudder, level the wings, and power as necessary if the aircraft starts to enter in the incipient stage of some rotation. But that is a classic cross-control stall. Now, how does it happen? Insufficient right rudder will do the same thing. In our case, we just used zero right, rudder, zero right rudder and let the ball swing way out. And it's neat to see them do it because when they do it and they master it so that the aircraft, they don't have to worry about that they can't get it out of. And um, you, as an instructor, if you're proficient at your trade, you typically try to ease their concerns with, there's probably nothing you can do that we haven't seen before and, and, I'm, and I'm reasonably sure I can get us out of everything, and, you know, except a midair, if, if, if you got hit from behind or something. Power off stalls. One of the greatest books that the FAA ever had was there. Yes, sir. A question on power on stalls. We do them at 2200 RPM mm -hmm. instead of full power. What type of aircraft, sir? It's a T-41. It's a 210 horsepower fuel injected in a climb prop in a 172. Okay, what, what the gentleman in the audience is saying is they do their stalls around 2200 RPM, and that's acceptable. Some aircraft, uh, it, aircraft that have higher performance engines and higher horsepower, uh, the book says, the practical test standard says, no less than 65% of max available power. So that's probably more than 65%, and that's acceptable. Some people will do them full power, 172 you want to do full power otherwise you're not going to get much of a, it's going to be a non-event. Bonanzas, uh, multi-engine airplanes when we do the stalls, we, we limit them to max 65 percent. It's usually 18 to 20 inches of manifold pressure and the RPM's equivalent to, to give the takeoff power.
but that's certainly acceptable. And um, they do that because a lot of aircraft will get you an excessive nose-up pitch attitude, which is really exacerbating the downward propeller giving you P-factor. And, and in some aircraft, you certainly need to refer to your aircraft flight manual. It'll tell you the, the altitudes to be lost that could be lost in, the, in a stall scenario. A lot of multi-engines. Is this a 45-minute or one-hour program? 45. 45. Thank you very much. Steep turns, we talked about them a little bit. The big thing that we find is they don't understand their load factor. And it, it, when you enter a maneuver, it needs to be entered at maneuvering speed and or less, depending on your weight. If you're not at maximum gross weight, your maneuvering speed is coming down. Because what happens is a lighter loaded aircraft is easier to upset and you can overstress the aircraft in a maneuver. Now, if a, if a, we all know that if you look at a load diagram, that 60 degree bank equals two Gs of, of gravity. And if it's done properly, if you pull back, of course, you could, you could increase that exponentially. However, I'm more interested in if we, if we do a weight and balance prior to the review and we end up 400 pounds or 300 pounds lighter than gross weight, well, maybe 200 now that I'm older because I've added a bunch. Um, I want them to know what the calculated VA is going to be for that airplane. And, and it's going to go down if we're lighter. And it will never be greater than, uh, it'll, it'll never be greater if you, because if the aircraft's at the demonstrated the maximum gross weight, then that's your published. But it'll, it can always be less. Again, 1,500 feet AGL. I used to have kids set the MSL altitude at an airport if we were 100, 100 feet of elevation. They'd go to 1,500 to indicate it. So we're really doing the maneuver at 1,400 AGL. So that's a little area that I talk about during the flight review. The basic instrument maneuvers. Boy, this is a big area, it, and it's near and dear to my heart. I could spend two days on it. The Instrument Flying Handbook used to be AC-6121. Now they've, they've changed them to the Instrument uh, Flying Handbook. I have them do unusual attitude recoveries under the hood. And how I do that is, is I will set the sectional on the floor, and I will ask them to transfer the controls to me, and then I'll ask them to pick an airport out on the sectional while their head is down. Leave it on the floor, pick out an airport, and I let them induce their own vertigo. By, by a couple minutes, I'll make some nice medium turns to the left, get the fluid moving in the inner ear canals. And then I'll say, you have the aircraft. And I'll have the aircraft in a, in, a, in a slightly nose high or a nose low, and I will watch how they recover from the unusual attitude. And we don't get excessive. We don't try to do a loop or anything like that. We don't want to scare them, certainly. But we want to be able to have in our own mind, rest assured that we have examined, they can get that airplane out of a situation. Uh, unusual attitude recovery, especially, excuse me, if I see them flying Cedar Key, Key West, flying uh, Bahamas, anybody that goes to the Bahamas can tell you when you look out across a horizonless sky and the water in the sky is the same color and there's no waves, it's a vertigo inducing situation. Nose low, this is when we see the most common mistakes. They'll reduce the power and they will start to pitch up with the bank still in the airplane. And this is a classic case where you can accelerate the stall with a high wing loading. And the aircraft will snap roll, or at least hard roll over on you, and it, which requires intervention by somebody with a, with a little more skill. But the, the key here is get the power back, get the bank, get the wings, power bank and pitch, and kind of do it all nice and slowly so that you don't load the aircraft up. Again, a little review for nose high. You want power, pitch, bank, resume cruise, and do your checklist. Nose low, power, bank, pitch, resume cruise, do your checklist. On a flight review, once I've done adi the unusual attitude recoveries under the hood, I then have them give me a diversion off their flight plan. The airport that you're going to is closed. Take me to a, another airport. And it's typically within 20 miles or so. And it allows them to keep their skills up. A good flight review takes a long time. And anybody that wants to do one in one hour, now it's different if you're going to go to 
uh, you've been doing it, you're teaching, and you just need to do it to meet the 6156 requirements. Again, the discretion of the person conducting the flight review is the person that says what, are, what won't happen. Area of operation six is a, in your practical test standards, of course, is basic instrument maneuvers. That's in your PTS. Slow flight, we talked a little bit about. Do it in various configurations. I'll speed things up just a little bit. Um, level flight, I do it from an airspeed transition. I start at 100 knots, go down to 90, go down to 80, go down to 70, until the aircraft is absolutely as slow as it'll go. The book says any reduction in power or any increase in load factor will result in an immediate stall. I continue to give tests today where the person brings it down to 70 and says, that's as slow as I go. Well, that's not the way it is. And we ask them to get the aircraft established in a climb. We ask them to get the aircraft established in a descent, if it's capable, and, um, and do some banking. It allows them to really check their, their coordination. Soft field takeoff and climb, we talked about it earlier. Take them to grass. Put them on some grass and let them see how grass affects the, the drag of the aircraft. It's really significant. And there are some runways that you can, if you land before noon and you haven't got out of there till afternoon, you might have to wait till evening to get out of there simply because the grass gets hot, it gets sticky. The density altitude increases to, a, to such an altitude that the aircraft can't get out of there. You notice Walt has stay in ground effect and accelerate to the best rate of, of climb. And he has acceleration out of ground effect, extremely dangerous. I, w I teach people to think about ground effect as, as if you were looking at an airplane flying straight and level and the vortices coming off the wingtips, just picture at the end of each vortice a parachute and the ropes attaching to the wingtips. Because when you're flying, that's what your vortices are. They're little parachutes of drag. When you get closer to the ground, however, the ground would, would interfere with the canopy and make the canopy spill that, that lift out. And that's what happens as you get closer to the ground. Your parachute canopy gets interrupted by the ground flow and the parachutes now deflate themselves and you get this, this increase in speed. And that's what ground effect's all about. And so it's, ground effect is something that you can, you, you can teach and you can show them and then you can actually go do it. And you pick yourself a nice long runway. Here's Walt uh, talking about a soft field landing. One of the biggest factors I find on a soft field landing and or a takeoff is they pull up on the runway and hit the brakes or use the brakes to make the turn as opposed to keeping some power in, keeping the tail, the, the yoke all the way aft and keeping a, a, a modest modicum of power so that you get some air force over the tail. Also, just as they round out on a grass airfield, very few will add that little touch of power that it's going to need to keep the nose up. And um, you'll, you'll see it time and time again, and they always tell you, this is the first time I've ever been to grass. Is it acceptable? On a flight review, um, this is a classic case, since it's not pass-fail, do a few of them there. Use it to your advantage. On a practical test, however, if they can't land on a soft field and do the proper things, that's the time just nip it in the bud right there, issue the disapproval, and let them go get some more training in that area. Is that the applicant's fault? Not in my opinion. It's an instructional fault. Instructor should have done it. Short, yes. Is that issue disapproval? It, on a, if I was an examiner and I was testing an app, as a flight instructor, I use it as a great advantage to give them some more training. Yeah, you, but if this is a flight review, there, there's no way to fail it. It just became dual and you didn't get a sign on it. That, that is correct. Or, there's, at your discretion, you could continue to do three or four more, and if that, they became acceptable, you've accomplished your mission. But, but an instructor's primary responsibility on a flight review, if the applicant is clearly not ready, and my, my acid test is if I'd put my daughters in that airplane with them, because that's what you're saying. You're saying you can take that airplane anywhere in the country and do uh, that check right, you know, they can fly based on the privileges of their certificate anywhere in the country. How are we looking on time, Malachi? Okay, okay. give me a time hack. What are we now? Okay. It's, it's hard. I'll never forget my private check ride, and the guy asked me to demonstrate a short field landing with an obstacle. And I came in. And I made it, and he goes, how do you think you did? I said, 
I said, I think I did very well, sir. And he goes, really? Did you look outside the airplane? And I said, uh, no. And he goes, well, let's go do that one again. And this time here, he even took my chin and he pushed it over and he said, look out. And what had happened, I had become so in institutionalized by my instructor, 50 feet, power set, speed, vertical speed, and, it, and the touchdown point that I failed to look out. Later, my family and I moved to a grass airstrip where we had a true 50-foot obstacle, and um, it was paramount to look out to see the tree, to see the fence line, and to be able to make that approach and make it safely and control the speed and rate of descent to touchdown. And the area that I grew up, we ended up short and soft, so you, you could really, and that's why grass is near and dear to my heart, not the type you smoke, obviously. What you're looking for on a flight review is that the person conducting the flight review, um, as the instructor, you keep an open mind about it and you look for body language. You ask them, where's your touchdown point? What are you aiming for? Where should this aircraft touch down? On the private standards, for a normal landing, it's the first third of the runway. For short field, it's no greater than 400 feet. For a normal landing, it's no greater than 200 feet, nothing short of and not greater than 200. And I find this to be a problem today as I check. I give examiner check rides as well as check instructor check rides. A check instructor at, a, at an authorized academy is the equivalent of an examiner. They go give the ride. Their recommendation then goes to a chief pilot who gives, who gives the okay, and then they get a pilot's license from their airman certification representative. And so that's a huge responsibility. So I give those check rides to the check instructors. And it's amazing the differences I get in how they conduct the, the, uh, the portions of those rides, especially in landing. We have to look at landings and takeoffs very carefully because statistics indicate that's where the problems are occurring. Okay? And if you're a data gatherer, which is what we do at the FAA a lot anymore, we gather data and we provide data and the people crunch the data and then they spit out this bit of information and say that's where you need to address your issues. And then Walt put that one in there. He says, I said soft field. And I wouldn't want to have been the guy sitting up in the front. This guy in the back might not have been too bad, but he might have had a headache. The crosswind takeoff and landing. Wow. This is where we get a lot of private failures. Pattern work. People fail to enter the pattern on the 45. They won't enter the pattern at the appropriate distance. The Aeronautical Information Manual says that the pattern is one half to three quarter miles off from the runway and at an altitude you start your crosswind at about 700 feet and your pattern is typically flown a thousand feet above the ground. We know that turboprop aircraft we typically fly 1500 feet and, and rotorcraft that would be working in this area would be working the opposite side of that traffic. And I take flight review applicants to a different airport and um, have them verbalize first how they're going to enter it and then ask the important question, why are you doing it that way? And not to trip them up, but to find out what they're thinking. A lot of times you will find this particular aircraft, you can see he's taking off with the wind right down the runway, and you'll hear him say, upwind, on the upwind, and if you look in the aim, however, that's really not true. The upwind would be on this side. That leg right there is the departure leg. And it's right in the aeronautical information manual. I used to be guilty of it myself. Upwind. But it's actually a departure leg. The upwind's on this other side, which would be in conflict with the helicopters if they're working that area. Again, just a little thought. Central Florida now is almost the flight rotorcraft training center of the world. If, if anybody's flown around Titusville and Melbourne area you'll, you'll, in Orlando, you'll know that to be a fact now. They're everywhere, and they're working the opposite side. So keep that in mind. If I can get one thing across, if, if one person gets saved by today, then my job has is, is, is been done. The crosswind takeoff. Wow. I, they'll get airborne, the right wing will drop or the left wing will drop and almost drag the runway and I'm, I'm trying to figure out this wind correction angle and it's a systemic problem 
going way back to when they were taught. Slips. If you look in the 6187, I think it's D 1 through 15 for, the, for a student, before he or she can solo, they're required to be taught slips. People today still can't slip an airplane. They don't understand the difference between a forward slip and a side slip. Side slip is when you have a crosswind and you're landing the aircraft on the center of the runway. Forward slip is when you're keeping the longitudinal axis aligned, but you're making the aircraft sidestep, if you will. The big difference is, difference in a forward slip and a side slip is wind. In a forward slip, no wind. Side slip, you're correcting for the crosswind while keeping your axis parallel to the center line. The landing, of course, is reverse, reverse of the takeoff, and as you can see, Walt got a little creative and put it upside down. We still see, to this day, accidents on crosswind landings. Just because the aircraft touches down straight, the control inputs out of the films that we've watched, the control inputs stop at that point. A lot of times the elevator will just go limp, and the ailerons go back to neutral, and now the loss of directional control on the landing rollout is it's fixing to occur. The accident's happening, you just haven't got there yet. The crosswind landing. Planning for the winds. Planning for what's going to happen on the base leg so that you can correct the key position. Do we turn in early? Do we go a little farther? Do we square the turn? And a lot of times air traffic control can throw you a little curve that you're not quite prepared for. I was giving a practical test not too long ago and they asked them to extend the downwind and just as they started to extend it down, I said, no, go ahead and keep it in tight and give me a short approach. And the, and the kid didn't have a clue what that meant. That's an instructional problem. That's an area that the, the person had never seen before. So is that a failure? It would not have been had they said, I don't understand. Can, you, can I have a clarification? But they just continued on until the tower was yelling at them. And to me, that's a problem. Here we put in a little bit of a win, and you'll notice in this previous slide, if there's not much of a crosswind, if the winds are calm, you can kind of keep it in tight. But if there's a crosswind and you know that and you've planned 91103, you've planned for the, you might want to give yourself a little extra room to get lined up on your final approach, to put in the appropriate corrections and stuff like that so that you can determine if you have the enough rudder, if you have, if you have the inputs that are going to be needed. If you need to carry a little extra speed, another problem area, people adding gobs and gobs of excess speed, not knowing how to calculate gust factors. And pilots typically do great till they're 20 feet above the ground, and then they get the ground gremlins. And so Walt put here, what can help? Well, teaching them to do slips can help. Teach them to do forward slips, side slips. Teaching them to fly when the wind's blowing as opposed to flight schools parking all their aircraft when the wind's going greater than 10 knots is a big problem. Tells me they're afraid to fly their airplanes and they're letting insurance dictate protocol. When the winds are blowing like that, a lot of my friends will call me and say, let's go take the tailwheel because this is where the rubber's going to meet the road and it's a lot of fun. Emergency landings. Nobody wants to have an emergency. But the problem comes is when one occurs and you're not ready for it. And fortunately for me, I've only had one. If you didn't count the one where I had to go to the bathroom real bad at altitude and I had to do emergency descent. But I had a Satabria blow up an engine, throw a rod out just after completing a loop. And uh, boy, it, got, it was very loud for a moment and then it got kind of quiet and then you just your training takes over. One of the greatest stories I ever told is um, one of my students that I trained over the years, he owned a restaurant and he used to get so frustrated and he'd say, Mr. Brady, you just talk too much, man. You're, you're, you're messing me up. Yeah. And so I would watch myself and as I matured as an instructor, I, I slowed down my delivery. And so I signed him off. He bought this airplane and I signed him off to solo up to Stone Mountain, Georgia. And about five hours later he called me as he was preparing to come home and he was all, you could obviously shaken. And he said, my motor just quit at 400 feet. And I was able to land the airplane in an open area of the airport. And uh, I just wanted to tell you, I was wrong. I heard your voice tell me everything to do. And so that's a great feeling of accomplishment. That's the best thanks an instructor can get. 
And uh, what it was, it was an engine that had a dual magnetos on a common gear, a, a Cessna product, and the gear had stripped. Magnetos got out of time, and the aircraft could no longer sustain enough power to fly. A great thing to hear, though. Then his wife called me. Then his mother called me. And we got passes to their restaurant for life. I think if he hadn't sold it, we could still be eating there. But anyway, that's, that's what makes you feel good. Setting up your glide, determine your landing site, maneuver to a landing site. One of the problems we find there is everybody does it at flight idle. They pull the throttle back to idle. That's a windmilling propeller, and that increases drag tremendously. What you might want to do is, is find out what the aircraft, like a zero thrust setting that we would use in a multi-engine, is probably around, probably close to 15, 1600 RPM, if you can believe that. And because that's what it's really going to glide like. We've seen some accidents in the past that had some fatal uh, consequences where the person, you can tell it was on film, and you can tell they had, the motor was quit, but it was windmilling. And then, this one, and then when the propeller stopped, their float increased tremendously. The, the aircraft flight manual gives you published glide distances. And I say, that works in a laboratory. Go practice it on a flight review with your applicant. Do five or six. I'm wrapping this thing up. The big secret, ladies and gentlemen, in the safety community, in the aviation community is, is safety. Coming to these things, listening to people have far more experience. The WINGS program, by the way, there's a new WINGS program being uh, put together. But the WINGS program gives you three hours of flying. It gives you seminars to attend. Today's uh, qualifies. And as I get this thing wrapped up, I'd like to thank you. And again, I, uh, Walt Schommel, dear friend of mine, a true uh, gentleman of aviation, big shoes to fill, so I'm very happy that he asked me. And uh, get involved with your safety program. Get involved. Become a volunteer. Get your training. Get your logbook entries. You can mail your certificate to our FISDO. Use your practical test standards. When you meet the requirements, you'll be ready for your next flight. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you have questions for Steve.